across the copies of Catherine's paper. Are they over here? Over in the corner, uh, yes. For anyone uh, who, who um, hasn't read it and would like to, um, well, have it with them at least. Uh, secondly, um, there is some spare food uh, over here. Uh, there's three lunches, um, which are a leftover from lunchtime. So starving graduate students, please, uh, please help yourselves. Um, it, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Catherine uh, Arna uh, today. Uh, she's one of our um, uh, dissertation fellows. Uh, this is for her the latest of a very long line of fellowships. Uh, this included uh, the Paul Klemperer Fellowship in the History of Medicine at New York Academy. Uh, she also won uh, the Outstanding Thesis Award as an undergraduate at the uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison. Um, she's currently uh, sort of working on a, a PhD, PhD dissertation uh, based at Hopkins. Uh, the dissertation uh, is called The Republic of Fever, Commerce, Warfare and the Making of Warm Climate Medicine in the Age of Atlantic Revolution. Uh, I think this promises to be a really major dissertation and then book uh, in that it's exploring a, a very, um, a, 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 a sort of, a really quite understudied uh, pre-modern phase in transnational uh, public health. There's quite a lot of material on, on loosely kind of national-based uh, public health in the pre-modern period. But these sorts of transnational public health networks she's working on uh, have been uh, very uh, neglected by historians. Uh, she's also, uh, on that note, been instrumental in the, in the founding and development of the pre-modern reading group here, which is a, a thriving uh, group. Uh, and it owes much to Catherine's energy uh, and support this year. Uh, and the pre-modern group is kind of co-sponsoring. We have yeah. some pre-modernists here. So, so here yeah. <laughs> Look at them. First from uh, the museum. Right, yes. <laughs> um, they're uh, they're co-sponsoring today's event. Um, and um, following that, uh, our own uh, Dodie McDowell uh, will be uh, giving comments uh, on, on the paper. So um, let's begin with Catherine. And um, off you go. Um, thank Chris for a very lovely introduction, and um, he set up some comments for my dissertation that I think will be, um, sort of help me, well, go along very well with that presentation I'm going to give. Even though you all read my chapter, I want to contextualize it a little more by talking about the larger project with um, fun pictures and arrows. Very appropriate for Atlantic history. My dissertation focuses on a major disease crisis in the 18th and early 19th century, yellow fever. As we learned about in our very first CHR seminar from J.R. McNeil, this is really a disease of the processes that made the Atlantic world. It had its origins in Africa and began crossing the ocean into the Caribbean in the late 17th and early 18th century. By the 1820s, the geographic scope of yellow fever expanded dramatically. So by that time period, we've gone from Africa to the Caribbean, all the way up along the U.S. eastern seaboard and into southern Europe. The inhabitants and travelers in between the Atlantic seaports confronted not only a destructive disease crisis, their experiences rested on what we might call old world diseases, like plague and smallpox pandemics. So the yellow fever crisis, um, as I'm going to talk about today, it's also a story about the role of the Atlantic world in confronting Europeans with a new medical challenge. In my dissertation, I'm tackling um, a specific problem in how scholars have studied this crisis. I think there's a glaring gap between how historians of disease, epidemiology on the one hand, and historians of medicine on the other, have framed their understanding of the pandemics and their legacy in the history of European health and medicine. Historians of disease have applied what we might call a global perspective in their studies of the disease's expansion and impact on health. So they frame the Atlantic world as a zone of interchange between, European, Africa, bleh, between Europe, Africa, and the Americas, examining the epidemiological impact of new and unique patterns of social and commercial exchange. Yellow fever came to thrive in seaports in the Americas because the seaports became unique nodes of this interchange of bodies, shipping, and pathogens within climate zones that were very different from those experienced in Northern Europe. Historians of medicine and disease control have also taken an interest in the impact of this new disease experience on medicine. So they pointed to its role in the development of new local forms of disease knowledge, medical practice, and disease control in the afflicted ports. They've also drawn our attention to the new networks and new communities, medical actors in these regions created to deal with this problem. 
And some are also raising some really important questions about the legacy of these developments for seaports encounters with subsequent global disease problems like cholera and the resurgence of, resurgence of plague later in the 19th century. In contrast to historians of disease, however, these scholars, with some exceptions, have tended to situate medical developments within isolated, local, imperial, colonial, and new national contexts. And I think this pattern speaks to a much broader trend in histories of medicine and disease control, and that's this tendency among historians to see transnational and global currents as unique products of a much, much later period. I don't expect all of you to be familiar with this scholarship, but I'm referring here specifically to scholars' focus on the medical and public health interventions that accompanied U.S. and European capitalist expansion to Latin America and Africa in the late 19th and early 20th century. In my dissertation, I want to bridge this gap. And I'm doing so by reframing our picture of the yellow fever crisis, its impact on patterns of medicine and disease control, and the legacy of those developments later in the 19th century. In order to do that, I'm taking up the same global perspective as historians of disease, like J.R. McNeil, as well as social and cultural historians of the Atlantic world, quite a cluster of them I argue that, like the disease itself, these new developments in medicine and disease control really need to be understood as products of the new patterns of movement in commerce, people, and pathogens during the age of Atlantic revolutions. In addition to tracing the flows of knowledge in these patterns, I've been focusing on how medical migrants and settlers in and between these ports created networks by negotiating ideas about knowledge authority, modes of communication, and codes of conduct in light of the political and cultural tensions that were dividing their worlds. By adopting these approaches, I've been able to trace how commercial and political change generated a web of medical networks <coughs> that did not map easily onto the borders erected by empires and new nations. I'm having a lot of people probe me and ask what the, where I came up with this concept. Um, so throughout the course of my research and writing, I've been grappling with categories and language um, that I can use to describe this sort of assemblage of actors and networks and how they've built and worked out their relationships to one another. Um, and we can certainly talk about this as we work through my chapter. This is really something that I just started to really work through recently. Um, for now, I just want to explain how I came up with the idea of a republic of fever. One of the biggest reasons is that I really felt that this came closest to capturing the language and tools that these men were using. Many of the actors that I'm looking at understood and operated in a community they defined as the Republic of Letters or the Republic of Medicine, so their own terms. And this included civilian doctors, included military doctors, surgeons, and even laymen, like the people that you wrote, read about today. This is a self-proclaimed community, a mode of exchange in letters, in print, that was supposed to transcend geopolitical and cultural barriers for the sake of useful knowledge. It had its roots in early modern Europe and carried on into the 18th century, the era of the Enlightenment. Um, our participants could not always realize this ideal. Many spent about as much time trying to work out a shared language and appropriate modes of conduct as they did actually exchange knowledge. The Atlantic Revolutions and the shifting disease landscape, I argue, created a novel space for actors moving within the Atlantic to reevaluate their place in the place of northern European centers of knowledge in this enterprise. So my story is about how these medical actors remade this sort of fragile concept of community and tried to adapt it to this unique geography of fever, fever experience that was linking up these different seaports. Um, and then before we delve into my chapter, I just want to um, outline how I'm developing this narrative um, in my chapters in order to better situate what we're going to talk about today. Again, this is a work in progress. I'm happy to talk about other components, but right anyway. Chapter one locates the roots of the Republic of Fever in what I call the unruly geography of yellow fever and fever study in the early 18th century. Here in this chapter, I want to lay out the premise that neither the disease nor the intellectual ecology of its study originated within colonies or empires. Those were products of a new scale of economic, commercial, and military expansion in the late 17th and early 18th century. Here I'm building on historians of disease to talk about how the sugar revolution, growth in the plantation economy in North America, 
An expansion of European imperial empires across the Atlantic transformed the disease landscape along the Atlantic Basin of the Americas. Through interregional trade, military activity within the Americas began stitching together African, Caribbean, and North American seaports in a shared disease ecology that was distinct from the climes and mix of bodies in Northern Europe. This Creole ecology, as J.R. McNeil called it, turned yellow fever from an African disease in, um, into a disease that moved along the Atlantic frontier of European expansion. At the very basic level, I'm trying to situate medicine in these larger transformations. So this chapter traces the ways in which many European settlers, itinerants, and medical officers traveling and working in these, in these ecologies slowly began adjusting and remaking the practices, disease knowledge, and intellectual networks that connected them to European centers of disease study. So by the mid-18th century, in the new global scale of warfare with the Seven Years' War, trade, and the flourishing print that expanded the traffic of military medical personnel within the Atlantic, not just in the Americas, but between Africa and the Caribbean. Travelers and information between colonies and even across imperial boundaries. In this context, scattered observations of yellow fever and its environs slowly gave way to a more coherent and shared body of knowledge, um, what a lot of these actors were identifying as the fevers of warm climates. As readers in different ports of the Americas began creating, circulating, referencing, translating, and even adapting one another's work. Chapters 2 and 3 move us into the 1790s. And they both probe the impact of new entangled political events in the Atlantic world. I apologize for those of you who don't do Atlantic history. A lot happened in the 1790s. With the aftermath of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, Haitian Revolution, and the height of abolitionist activity. Chapter 2 focuses on medical developments within the Atlantic, or the Anglo Atlantic. It looks at how these political forces, which really threatened to tear the Anglophone world apart, actually managed to create conditions for a transnational medical community to coalesce within the Americas. This is because the above events generated unprecedented patterns of movement in shipping, travel, and information between Africa, West, Indi West Indian, and U.S. ports. And the spark was lit in 1791 when a ship of abolitionists traveled from Great Britain to the coast of Africa with the intent, uh, with interest in a free colony for many minute slaves. They then traveled to the West Indies. Along the way, um, they picked up yellow fever and carried it into the Caribbean. And the ship arrived in the midst of both the French and Haitian revolutions. In the wake of both of these events, the French and British troops descended upon Saint-Domingue and carried out battles in the region. And what this meant is that there was this new influx of pathogens and fresh bodies from both Africa and Europe, which created a reservoir for dramatic outbreaks of yellow fever in several parts of the West Indies. The events in San Domingue also transformed the region's relationship to the new United States. The new country's trade with this region, though still really vibrant, was in a state of flux with a lot of the ports um, after the British Empire tried to limit um, the former colonies' interaction with the Caribbean. In addition to those connections, um, thousands of black and white refugees from San Domingue fled to the New Republic, introducing a new interchange of shipping, bodies, and pathogens between the U.S. and the West Indies. My chapter looks at how these changes in spaces and social makeup of, of ports altered Anglophone medical writers' ideas about the intellectual and cultural relationship between their communities in the West Indies and the United States. As they increasingly came to share spaces and objects of study, men in the Caribbean and the U.S. struggled to work out their conflicts over the political meanings they attached to the ships, bodies, and sources of information that crossed between different political contexts and between the worlds of slavery and anti-slavery. We see this in the growth of new epistolary networks and actors' efforts in print to adapt their work so they can speak to different audiences and, lo um, and local contexts within the Americas. And by the early 19th century, as yellow fever persisted, the majority's medical men really began to share a sharp sharpened sense of intellectual commonality and distinction from what they were increasingly unified in, in calling medicine of Northern Europe. 
They were building a distinct community that was in fact robust enough to sustain internal political and geographic divisions. The other thing in the Arab Atlantic revolutions also altered the relationship of the Francophone Atlantic to the larger medical world. During the peak years of the French and Haitian revolutions, thousands of inhabitants from Saint-Domingue fled to different parts of the Atlantic world. As I mentioned before, a particularly large portion of them fled to the United States, either residing temporarily or integrating themselves into the country's Atlantic port cities. Chapter 3 just looks at how this diaspora of refugees and disease affected the ways in which early Republican medical communities remade the world of fever study. So among the uprooted refugees were surgeons, physicians, lay medical writers, who brought with them fever literature, cultural identities, and networks that differed from those among Anglo-Americans facing the same problem of yellow fever in the early American Republic. We read about um, three of these case studies in the chapter, uh, Felix Pascali, Louis Valentin, and Jean Debis. Dislocated and stigmatized in U.S. ports as agents of disease and even political subversion, many of the medical refugees actually tried to transform fever study um, and the first-hand experience with the disease into a niche and a source of medical authority. So tracing the different ways in which refugees integrated themselves into local communities of fever study. And I'm also interested in how they remap those communities. And I see evidence of these men turning themselves into intermediaries who linked Anglo-American communities to those in the French, communi the French Caribbean um, and even Spain in the Spanish outbreaks. As new epistolary networks, treatises, reading practices, and identities took shape, a new republic, as we call it, began manifesting itself in the creation of new print forms and language. Chapter 4 focuses on one particularly important technology these men used to form and promote this envisioned medical world order, the medical journal. Periodicals like the Medical Repository, which is going to be um, one of my primary case studies in this chapter, um, and which you also read about in Chapter 5, uh, emerged in the context of the yellow fever crisis. So while based in New York, um, the journal actually was produced by medical writers who represented different parts of the Atlantic world, including the French Caribbean. It enjoyed contributions and readership that extended even beyond their spheres. And while the journal welcomed contributions from correspondents in Northern Europe, editors and authors generally tried to restrict the ways in which these men could participate in discussions about warm climate diseases. So there's a trend, for example, in um, the reviews that came up in the medical repository. A lot of the editors would review these studies in the West Indies, even if they were disagreeing with the views, trying to emphasize the fact that they were part of this collaborative project to study the warm climate zone. Any of these men in Great Britain who tried to participate in this study, they just totally tore apart their, their treatises on the level that they just didn't have the authority to participate that way in those discussions. So what we see in the motives, content, circulation, and uses of such journals are medical men in different parts of the world trying to realize something distinct from the local, imperial, and even cosmopolitan communities in which they operated, communities like the Republic of Letters. I'm going to return to Chapter 5 in just a moment. I just um, want to highlight my final chapter. This is where I want to reflect a little on the legacy of this phenomenon of the 19th century. Um, I'm still developing this chapter, and in the end it might just turn into a chapter for a potential book. Um, and basically, what I want to ask in this chapter is what happened to the tools and networks of the Republic during the advent of a new series of epidemiological events in the 1830s and 1840s, namely the first waves of cholera, which hit some of the very same ports that had grappled with yellow fever over so many decades. So, chapter five. I have to say, I am actually really excited to present this chapter to this group because consuls, commercial agents, and merchants more generally are actually new territory for me. And honestly, also for my advisors and colleagues back in here, back in Hopkins. And I have to be honest with you people, I actually had not intended to write this chapter. Um, the idea of this chapter actually developed in the course of my research. I kept coming across all these references to consuls and commercial agents and all the medical literature I was looking at, um, the medical repository, treatises, 
and they were coming up in physicians' you know, networks and correspondence, and they weren't just actually sending off treatises that were written by doctors and physicians, they were writing their own treatises. And so I decided to check out their records in the National Archives in DC, and I've been starting to dig um, into some material of the National Archives in the UK. I mean, you guys obviously noticed that I was focusing pretty heavily on American consuls. We talked about that as well. And I was just really struck um, by their presence, the variety of ways they were integrating medicine into statecraft and statecraft into medicine. And so I just thought they might be worthy of their own chapter. I felt like they were raising some really important questions about the role of commerce in not only moving physicians and surgeons and the knowledge that they were creating, but also producing new medical actors um, and forms of knowledge production. So what you see in my chapter is an attempt to sort of work through the following questions, which I want to bring to the table today. They're just some issues that I've been working with. And that's, what do consuls and commercial agents add to our picture of medicine and health? Um, and am I missing some other important questions in this chapter? Am I contextualizing these actors in the right way? These are some of the questions I'm just going to throw out there. Um, and they need not completely frame the discussion, obviously. I'm also really excited to hear from Dr. McDowell and from you what issues you see in this chapter, questions you think I need to address, um, and just your general reactions. So. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> A man of multiple talents, uh, PhD from Yale, um, but his work primarily centers uh, on, on Africa and particularly uh, sort of Africa's relationships with, with the Indian Ocean. So we're going to get a sort of a, a different oceanic perspective. Here. We'll see. <laughs> I want to thank, thank Chris uh, for chairing today. John Brook, of course, invited me and then in, wasn't here, so I, maybe he had the best, the best move of everyone. So. I, I, as someone who works on the Indian Ocean, I don't really get to offer my opinions on American history very often, except when I have the captive audience of GEC world history classes. Um, so I, you know, and then I get to explain to them how the U.S. history is, in fact, a very prominent subfield of global history. Um, so I'm glad that we, I'm glad that we, that we get to talk today. Um, Catherine Arner has presented us with a very interesting paper on warm climate medicine in the age of Atlantic revolutions. Um, the paper that we read deals with the years between 17, the 1790s and the 18 teens and focuses on consuls and commercial agents to connect yellow fever, commerce, and diplomacy. As I see it, the paper sets out to argue two main points. First, that this, this period produces two, a new kind of medical actor, and these are consuls who are taking part in disease surveillance. And that in doing so, that this novel crossing of roles in her own words, broaden the range of agents who made this new medical world order. Uh, and the second major point is that the involvement of these heretofore uh, non-medical actors expanded the geographic scope of what she calls the Republic of Fever. Um, and as she just explained, this febrile federation, if you will, uh, is central to her larger argument in the overall dissertation project. And, and one of the things that she seems um, it, from our own discussions and the way she framed it in uh, one of her, her pieces is um, in the overall dissertation project is to rescue this period of medical and health history from frameworks of later 19th century and 20th century historiography. So, um, and, and the argument of the paper, as I hope you've all read it, uh, rests on people who served as U.S. consuls, and that does not mean that they're Americans, but served as U.S. consuls during this period. Henry Hill in Havana, Etienne Catalan in Marseille, and David Bailey Warden in, in Paris. Um, the paper, in my opinion, we can, and we can talk about, largely achieves its goals. I think it's, a, it's a, a very well done paper. The footnotes alone are the beginning point for a great orals field if someone wanted, wanted to do that. Um, I find that this, this section on the Warden and his work in Paris is really, I thought, is the most convincing because he was so clearly <coughs> implicated in the overlying matrices that she's talking about, um, of matrices of medical and scientific knowledge, of diplomatic relations, and shifting definitions of consular roles. I think in his account, we see most clearly a, a, conscious, a conscious reworking of, of what a consular role is and what, and what role they should play. Um, he himself was a frequent crosser, crosser of the Atlantic during this period, and we also see most clearly in his account 
how the events of the period, uh, the, the Haitian Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, punctuate his activities. Um, Warden, we also see in, in his account, he's asked to serve as an intermediary between, between scholars, having a, having a debate about the nature of, of fever. Um, one of whom, Pascalis, um, Catherine says, walked a fine line between productive criticism and personal attack in his review of the other's work. I will walk no such line today. Um, so I would like instead to, to, to de delve into the realm of productive criticism and, and offer three areas that we can think about as we, as, to open up the discussion of the paper. One is this question of global perspectives and how we can consider them. Uh, the second is these are agents, but what of their agency? Uh, so to think historically about the, the agency of these, of these people. And then third, to think about public health and its way of knowing things as contrasting with historical forms of knowledge and the way that we're, and the way that we're using that. Um, so first, how can we put this work on medicine and health in this region and in this period in a more global perspective? This is one of the concerns that, that you laid out, so I want to think, and think about this. Um, I work on the Indian Ocean, and scholars, some scholars of the Indian Ocean are, are fond of calling the region the cradle of globalization, or the first global world, right? Um, they are quite wary of claims, of uh, claims on the novelty of globalization in the modern era. Um, and I think here we can take a page from their playbook to ask about the material you're, you're thinking through, what is new, what is changing? What are the continuities? What are the older continuities? Um, you know, and there are other people here who can speak much, much better to this than I can. Um, but the trade routes and the goods exchanged in the Atlantic have long continuities. And I would encourage us to think about other links to previous periods. So the genealogies of these consuls, where they come through, show a much longer relations to trade networks across the Atlantic. You know, and if we think about uh, other, you know, Again, not to get too far later in the, in the 19th century, but you know, Nathaniel Hawthorne opens um, the Scarlet Letter with his long, the long part about being a customs officer and sort of having to deal with things coming and going. Uh, the other, you know, you can't think about the American activity in the sea without thinking of Herman Melville, whose father was also a merchant uh, who had been who actually died, I think, of yellow fever in the Caribbean. Um, and so he's the way that the imaginary of the literary imagination of the 19th century we can see also ties into an earlier period of exchange. Um, so if we think about what's new, certainly the United States is a new player and the lifting of British monopolies changes the economic landscape of who's taking part in trade and how trade is, is forming. Um, but how does, does this paper account for continuity um, of, merchant, of merchant networks of exchange? Uh, you know, how, how, how these things are taking place. And sometimes I feel like the paper threatens to kind of over-inscribe Americanness or the nation state and American identity at the expense of a larger global story. Um, so, you know, how, if, if we want to foreground the novelty of this Atlantic world, it's the, the American the changes that are taking place, how does that cut off a, long, a longer understanding of continuity and global picture? Um, the second point is to think about consuls and commercial agents. They were agents, but what of their agency? I wanted, I wanted to know a lot more about them um, uh, and about their own networks and how, how they used them. First of all, what were their orders? What did they think they were supposed to be doing, right? As you, you talk about what they ended up doing, but what do they think they're supposed to be doing? Um, what about their, their personal status? They, were, you know, they weren't part of an impersonal bureaucracy, but embedded in pre-existing, most of them in pre-existing networks or having to, or, or fashion um, networks. And I think here about um, Abner Cohen's work as an anthropologist on trade diaspora, um, and certainly Philip Curtin draws on that for you know, thinking about cross-cultural trade. How do, how do people organize themselves in such a way to maintain trade over distance and to ensure um, good flow of information, but also um, the completion of goods and, and deliberate of justice at whatever we um, so to think, if we want to think, they're not just neutral observers, they, they have agency. And, and looking around and trying to find some examples of this, I came across the example of Samuel Shaw, who was a, an artilleryman in the, in the Revolutionary War under General Knox. He left at the end of the war, had a letter of endorsement from General Washington. He was very well received, but because like many of his countrymen who had invested so much in the war, he, had, he was penniless. 
So he was asked, because of his prominence, to join a trade mission to China in the 1790s, where he went, and while he was there, wrote a letter to John Jay saying, gosh, we should really have a consul here. Um, and he then, when he came back, he was made the consul and sent back on another mission, where, because of his, he was able to gain enough wealth, in, in, from my preliminary reading of the source, where he was able to gain enough wealth from this to, to return to build the biggest commercial ship that had ever been built in the United States at that point, which he then sailed back via Bombay to Canton, where he had been based, and sold to the Portuguese at a profit, at, you know, remitting his money through a very variety of networks back to the States. So he ends up becoming quite wealthy, even though he started because of his connections and network, um, so that he has something personal at stake. So to think about them, think about the agency of these, of these people. What are their own interests? And also, what does, it, what does it mean to be far from a new nation and this cosmopolitan interest, um, this cosmopolitan exposure? Where, where are their loyalties? Are there, are there disloyalties? Again, I think we can question um, the role of the nation state and how are these, are these following their, their, what they're supposed to be doing or how, to what do we that are they at the age? And so, um, what are their own health interests? Did their wives or children, are they affected by yellow fever? Are they, you know, how, how are they protecting their own health, not just observing health? Um, and this also brings up sort of their relation to what they're working on, brings up the question of categories, which I think the paper, I think, struggles with. Um, I think of it in terms of the emic and the etic categories, you know, which are the categories that people themselves are constructing or think about, and which are the, which are the, which are the categories that the historian is imposing in terms of, of, of making sense of this. Um, obviously, the Republic of Fever is one is your is your own construction and one you're putting on. But I also think I think we need to think about the category of the medical. Um, it's 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 something that you I think that, that the histori historiography brings to this. But do to what degree do these agents see themselves as medical actors, or even differentiate the forms of knowledge they have as particularly medical versus commercial? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it's 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 worth thinking through those things. So think about their own categories of analysis and the categories of analysis that you want to use, and maybe to make some some differentiation. Because at times I was unsure. I was unsure how we should take those things. Um, and so third, I, I hope we have some colleagues from public health here. Um, but I'd like to to invite them um, to use their perspectives to help us think like epidemiologists so that we can be better historians. Um, because you know, we see in the paper, for instance, that, that, that one thing that Hill tried to do in Havana was to determine, was, the paper says, the sheer magnitude of the mortality among the American seamen. Elsewhere, the paper gestures towards the role of these consuls in surveillance and health, health surveillance. Um, from a public health point of view, measuring disease and talking about disease surveillance is a rigorous and difficult undertaking. Um, measurement is, is nearly impossible. If you want to understand mortality rates, for instance, you need to know both the numerator, who died, and the denominator, who was living there, what's the total population. And you, and you have to be able to do both with some degree of accuracy. Um, so, um, and you also consider the, the whole population, the true population, not just those who end up in hospital, not just those who are, who are prominent, who, who drop by your office with a complaint, you know, these kind of things. Um, and so to do this with any kind of accuracy at a time of war, in a port city, during a period of increased mobility, seems an impossible task. So Hill and others were much more interested in the numerator, and even a small portion of the numerator, than the, than the overall question. Um, they had a very specific gaze in regard to the disease, and I don't think they really were intent on understanding the full population. Okay? So just that we want to think, you know, he, he circulates facts and figures, um, but really can we think of this more not as, not as medical knowledge, or, or medical knowledge, but more along the lines of case reports than on hard data, you know, and the kind of things, the kind of data that he's and others are reporting. And I think the analysis shows that Hill saw his own firsthand accounts as authoritative enough to include them in a report on the disease's course. So when we think about this, I think this connects the, the point about agency. Consuls and agents um, have a kind of epistemological power. Um, they create knowledge for people at a distance. At a distance, they establish truths that become national intelligence. Um, they feed information into the machinery of state. 
big established data, right? And if we think about economics and, and the, this assumption of perfect information, they provide some information uh, and allow people to exploit its, its asymmetries. Um, but I, so I think we need to see that the limitedness of what they can, what they can say um, and what they can see. Uh, and, and, and when we think, when we talk in a public health or medical sense of, of surveillance or mortality or these kind of things, I think that uh, obscures the kind of biases and historical source work that we should be trying to do more to sort of what, the, what they are actually seeing and what, what, limits, what limits their point of view. Um, you know, should their limited point of view, um, you know, it doesn't even, I don't think qualify necessarily for Foucauldian sense of surveillance, much less uh, a public health one. So, you know, how, how we, should we think about these categories? Um, so those are, my, those are my three points. One, to think about a global view um, and a longer, a longer term and continuities to think about the role of consuls as agents and they, they, um, themselves, um, and about questions of public health versus historical method, and how that helps us think about the set of, of problems. Um, you know, in reading this paper, it also brought to mind another story about new nations of diplomats and the making of an Atlantic and global disease. And here, I'm talking about the newly independent Congo in the 1960s, right? So due to what might be called uh, limitations in the, the Belgian education policy in the Congo, which if you'd like to read a dissertation about this, there was one written about 40 years ago by Newt Gingrich. Um, you know, there were very few professionals of any type, bureaucrats or diplomats who could take on roles in the newly independent Congo. Um, and so this matched up at a time of terror in Haiti under Papadakou Valle. Uh, and so through UNESCO, the UN brokered a deal where Haitian diplomats came in to fill vital roles in, in, Congolese, in, in, in the Congolese government. Uh, and it, it, was, it was this, through this route of Haitian, Haitians returning home, that scientists believe that HIV passed across the Atlantic. And so in this, this sort of taking this, something that was African, and um, crossing from, the, from Africa to the Caribbean, and then from the Caribbean to the US, a disease come, goes, becomes a global disease. So I think there's a, there's a similarity in story, uh, which I know we don't want to get dragged in to the 20th century. But it, it suggests the way that we can think about the movement of disease, the categories um, that people use to think about it, and, and the community of scholars who talk about these things um, to, to more productively engage your great paper. Thank you very much, Terry. Thank you for very, uh, very vigorous uh, and uh, thought-provoking uh, commentary. I, I don't know if Catherine wants to respond to, to, uh, to those questions. Uh, or whether we want to just open up, what people would you like to do? Okay. Um, you know, I'm going to let us open up a little bit. The, okay. These questions were just so, um, uh, I need some time to think about them. <laughs> so a little bit. And I also think, I imagine that um, some of this will come out from the discussion. Of I was hoping stuff. we could think together with these. Yeah, yeah. This is not, this is not, I was not challenging you to a duel. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, although, you know, that might be, that might be uh, equally entertaining. Um, Especially with the video. Okay, <laughs> uh, questions. I'd like to invite questions. I think we only do about three weeks just to digest what we just did. Right, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, John. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what kind of uh, fault lines existed within this Republic of, um, of, Re Re Republic of Fever, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because at times it seems like this, um, this, this monolith, right? And we have these, these new agents, these, these, these consuls, and those are more commerce oriented. Um, but, but how did they interact with those who might, we might consider more, more medical? Um, what kind of conflicts were there? What kind of conflicts? Yeah to kind of broaden the question? Um, it's a really good question. I think because, as I've tried to lay out in my paper, I think consoles are really hard to sort of um, just kind of group into one sort of class. Um, so I think it, it really depended on, on the particular consoles and their context. Um, you know, for some of these guys, like, you know, David Bailey Ward, who'd been dabbling in, he would not like to hear the word dabble, but, um, <laughs> You know, he, he, he had been involved in various aspects of the sciences and medicine, and I think in that context, there, there was little conflict. You know, when you see the correspondence, it, it's, it's like they're corresponding with somebody who had been educated in Edinburgh, you know, and gotten a full degree. Um, so it, it, it's really contingent, I guess. It's the best way I can answer it. I don't know if that's time to figure it out, but... Um, yeah, I was just wondering if there were any instances where um, one of these consuls would, would give his opinion on, on, on something and then you would have another individual 
um, you know, writing against him. You know, no, you're completely uh, misrepresenting the situation. You don't understand what's actually going on. Um, you know, kind of the, the, the discourse that, that, that's involved here is this new idea of medicine is being constructed. If, if you have any of those kind of interactions. I haven't seen them in the sources. It doesn't mean that they're not there. I mean, if I, if I return to the example of Henry Hill, though, what's interesting about Henry Hill is that even though they're actually um, taking his work and trying to publish it in a medical journal, they're being a little selective. And they're pulling elements out of his um, his work and, and sort of remaking it to actually make it appeal to a wider audience and you know to physicians who are interested in specific aspects of medicine. I don't think Henry Hill, for example, would actually view himself as someone on par with like a physician. But he's acting like a physician, um, but he's being. It's not even that he's being remade into a physician. Um, I might have articulated it that way, and I should probably go back and reformulate it, but. They're actually trying to sift out a lot of these elements that kind of smack of, you know, administrative work and administrative thinking. The table with, you know, the list of, you know, all this, all of the, the deceased um, the semen on it, and you know, even remaking his title and trying to reorganize the information um, in a way. It's almost like they're, it's almost like they're co-authors. There's a chain of authorship in a way. So it's not really, it's not really a conflict per se. It's more like a sort of a tension between those worlds, and it's kind of, there's not a clear cut tension, it's not always a conflict, it's, it's just these little elements that I think are, are limiting certain ways of communication, sort of limits the sort of language that they use to actually um, establish certain, certain medical beliefs or even um, treatises that grow out of this. Does that answer your question? Okay. Dan, I'll call, I'll, I'll call you. And since there was a post between myself and Alan, um, uh, I, I, I apologize for that, but Alan, okay. Yes, you Alan. Yeah. Uh, I want to pick up on uh, something that Dodi was bringing up about continuity and change. Mm -hmm. And uh, that might be helpful for contextualizing chapter five and the expansion of uh, the Cuban Republic. And you know, your concern in part is the internationalism of this and on both the Atlantic and global scale. And I was thinking of offering, let's say, a, a three-part development, which you could define probably better for me than me. But one is that in the 16th century and the 17th century, that Europe in particular wants to collect for medicine, uh, for medicinal purposes, plants, medicines, mm -hmm. You know, they want to create, uh, they want the cordial, they want the recipes, as they called them, for creating medicines to solve ailments. And that's what they're collecting in large measure from, from around the world. Uh, and they're passing this information around within Europe. Um, and of course, with all the commonplace books that you can find in the archives, it's still at a handwritten stage that people are collecting this information. And then a second stage would be really the 1720s till the end of the 18th century when you have this international interest in smallpox mm -hmm. that extends, that brings in Africa and Asia and the Americas and people are trying to figure out how do we solve this particular um, disease. Why there's just the focus there maybe because the effect it, you know, was so bad in so many places, and also that information was coming from the East, especially uh, into Europe. And now you're talking about the third stage, where it's much more organized, and the information's getting printed. I mean, the smallpox stuff is being printed in the Royal Transactions in Britain, uh, in Britain and a few other places, but this just seems more sped up, that things are being printed and the information disseminated in an international context, whereas certainly in the first stage with the collecting of, inform of information and plants for medicinal purposes, it's not organized, you know, except that you tell the merchant, you know, please bring back what you can about medicines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know how we fit the second smallpox stage in between the third and the first, but it does seem that there is a, a, a development of stages in the dissemination of medicinal information in the Atlantic and global context at this time. Hmm. Interesting thought. I hadn't thought about the smallpox um, context. Are you also are you talking about um, ventures that were sponsored by the state? 
or are you are you talking about just sort of general circulation? Well, there's there's pamphlets being enlargement, you know, measure that are published about smallpox, but also especially in London and Paris, mm -hmm. there's a lot of interest, and especially the Royal Society is just publishing information, and the information within the transactions is what they've learned in Africa, what they've learned in Asia, because this information has been brought back to Europe, and they're writing this stuff up. Now, how it gets disseminated out beyond those small groups of elites, you know, I'm not sure. Except those pamphlets are, are, are popular. No, I have, I have looked at some of those. Um, no, I am, I am familiar with the, the smallpox uh, circulation. It's also a really interesting dissertation that came out by Amanda Moments. I don't know if you know of her. Oh, um, she's the one that published? Oh, no, no. Minority published a piece in the William Mary. Yeah, yeah, no, she did. Um, no, this is a dissertation that covers it. I hope she turns it into a manuscript. But it talks about a lot of the uh, very cosmopolitan networks that emerged in medical philanthropy. These were private, there's some intersection with, um, with those involved in the state. Um, but it was literally, she calls it sort of the global um, circulation of information about smallpox, inoculation, inoculation practices during this period. Um, between Great Britain, the Americas, as you were pointing out, um, but even into the East Indies. So it is actually a very little practice. In terms of um, where my period fits into that, I think I see I, th I see, it, see it coming together with, um, coming out of two situations. I mean, one, the smallpox situation, what you have happening to a lot of my, um, of my actors, I'm talking about um, physicians, lay writers more generally, is that they are participating in those networks, but what happens in the context of diseases like yellow fever, emerges this idea of distinction and distinct climate zones outside of Northern Europe, is a lot of them are actually, um, turning away from those networks um, and placing limits on them. You actually have these figures in Great Britain, for example, who want to participate in this new disease problem. But you have these actors outside who are basically saying, you, you can't really contribute anything. You guys don't have yellow fever. You, know, you have no experience. What can you contribute for useful knowledge? And that's where they start gravitating towards each other. And that's where a lot of them are turning to these seaports. Um, for information about the disease and for people who have first-hand experience with the disease. And I think that's where consuls and merchants and their networks come into play. I think that's, that's one component. And I, I don't know how to kind of bring these together and we can talk about this. There's another context that I don't really address in there, um, but I also think it's very important, um, is that there is this other framework that I think these men are playing with. Playing with is a really bad way of putting this are deploying, and it comes from the Mediterranean, and that's the context of plague in the early modern period, because you do actually have consuls from this earlier period in the Mediterranean, and they are dealing with plague surveillance from the Levant and from these other parts as early as the 17th century. So you have that system in place, so when you have Americans and other types of um, actors entering the Mediterranean, I, I see them actually plugging into that a little bit um, and adapting it to the sort of disease surveillance that they're doing and the practices that they're sort of importing back into the Americas. So I guess there's kind of, I don't really know how to relate those two. I mean, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts based on what I just told you, but. No, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> how do we go from smallpox to, and plague yeah. to, to these hot diseases? Right. No, it's, it, but I definitely see the sort of turn away from, um, you know, latching onto these networks devoted to smallpox, the sort of centers affiliated with them, to these particular seaports and these centers. And that might also explain why we're seeing a lot of these consuls and commercial agents suddenly coming up into that literature more frequently, is that more and more people are gravitating towards these ports. And that means pulling on not, not only um, you know, physicians who are in those regions, but also people like commercial agents and consuls who are becoming much more involved because of their various duties in dealing with medicine. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Sort, of. <laughs> sort of. You know, part of it is, yeah. is just to rethink, you know, I thought the paper was very fine, but maybe just to rethink this, this that longer international, or wider international yeah. and longer international context for the transmission of medical information. Yeah. Dan? Oh.
Well, I love this paper, I, especially the kind of methodology with the actor network in the 18th century. Um, and I just had, I had three thoughts or questions. Um, the one concerning councils and their kind of networks, they're, they're very formal, literate net, networks they're involved in. Do they ever overlap with like less formal and more illiterate networks? Maybe, um, I was thinking maybe uh, in Native American communities in Florida, Georgia, um, slave communities in the Caribbean, or even uh, tavern communities of sailors, um, and like how do these uh, these bodies of knowledge kind of intersect with this formal network? Um, secondly, uh, was yellow fever ever used in the broader kind of context of of uh, creating uh, kind of uh, constructions of uh, of climate, of race, of spatial orientation between the northern and southern hemisphere and things like that. Um, and th those were just really the two thoughts. And then last, well I guess last you brought up the, the plague, is, is yellow fever a democratic disease? Or is this the lowly that are, are dying from yellow fever? Or are there like kind of prestigious elites frequently dying from, from this disease? Just I guess the last question first. Um, democratic to some extent, yes. I mean, you know, it, it really afflicts people who, there, there's a way in which, play, um, sorry, there's a way in which I think um, place plays an important role in this, you know, that's sort of like where you're located within a seaport is actually going to affect um, how you get yellow fever. Um, in the sense that there's like a differential in terms of whether lower class people get it or higher class, it's, it's an issue of who can actually leave the city. And it tends to be people who are wealthier, who, you know, have a really lovely airy, airy plantation, you know, on the outskirts of Baltimore, Philadelphia, versus people who, you know, they're working at the seaports and they just don't have the funds or means to escape. Um, so I really think that in that context, it's, it's really, it's a little bit of both. Um, there's also an issue of race, which I think is really, really key in yellow fever, and um, the sort of idea that there's this, these different levels of immunity among um, African Americans, Africans versus um, Euro Americans, and that plays an important role not only in the actual mortality um, demographics as we understand it, but ultimately what that d does to Euro Americans' perceptions of themselves and perceptions of their health, um, and sort of anxieties about, about race and about identity more generally, and their ability to actually handle a disease or handle this type of climate. Um, in terms of your really great question, formal networks of consuls overlapping with informal networks, and sort of literate versus illiterate, I would say that yes, that definitely does happen. There's an interaction, it happens with Henry Hill, most definitely, you know, who's in Havana, he's kind of new, and, you know, he's trying to grab onto these different sources to actually make sense of the disease, but also to try and track down medical resources. And ultimately, a lot of, you know, sailors who come into town or other types of shipping, you know, they have their own <coughs> informal networks about, you know, Havana and the port, about medical resources, about, you know, Scottish doctors like John Holliday who are roaming about in there. And I think that's a moment where, you know, he, he actually is turning to them for, um, for information. The difficulty was tracking that down, and this is where I would need to find things like diaries and actual letters, which I've just now found for Henry Hill, so I want to visit those. I don't think you're necessarily going to find that um, in a lot of the administrative records and the dispatches he's sending back to um, the Secretary of State. And not in the treatises, ultimately. I mean, they're not really, you know, people like the medical repository, they might make references here and there, but their voices just tend to get lost. And so you have a hard time sifting through these treatises and discerning where he'll actually got his information from. Um, so the answer is, I need to look at more primary sources. So it's a really excellent question. Um, can I, can I, uh, to, yes, I, I mean, I'm just thinking on that, you know, where, where they get the, I, I'm, you know, in, the Church of James Christie in Zanzibar in the 1870s tries yeah. to put together a history of cholera in the Indian Ocean and its circulation. And he is asking all the native traders, what, what, you know, so he's turned to them as a source that you know the Europeans and others wouldn't use. I mean, 
historians have not used as sources. He's yeah. using them as a source to try to understand things. And he also has sort of go-betweens. And so I you know, wonder, like, if you look, if you look at the office records of the consulate's office in Havana, you know, who are who is employed there? Does he have his own slaves? Does he have servants? Mm -hmm. Who are people who mm -hmm. kind of can cross the socioeconomic boundaries more easily yeah. than he can and, and get the kind of information he might need to get? So I've been shifting through sources to get a better sense of networks, even if we don't have the clear diary entry saying, well, I didn't view the scene of right. yes, right. of course. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. Well, we have James Gordon publishing on African Americans being caregivers in Philadelphia during the Bill of the Death yeah. Stare. You know, one wonders if actually African Americans are being mobilized to be caregivers and nurses because of these presumptions, because there's people that can't leave, and yeah. because of presumptions about the community. Mm -hmm. So there, you might find parallel communities in. You might find parallel actions in the Caribbean, but I mean, it might be worth even looking at, at Fortin and Fortin's correspondence to see what he's talking about. Okay. He's, how he's discussing these things with this, you know, the fellow who's fellow Okay, no, I would um, like that reference. That would be really useful. So, Just ask a very general question, picking up on something that Dodie brought up, which was the business of the emic and the etic, and uh, just the extent to which. Uh, this Republic of Fever, I mean, do, would you find that anything remotely resembling such an entity uh, or an object is, is actually identifiable in your text, in the, the, the actors you're talking about were sort of at some level aware of being part of this far-flung, very diverse uh, community, or was it, is it really something that is just purely an analytical convenience for ourselves? Uh, and part of the sexy title. And, and needless <laughs> to say, one of the sexiest titles of, of the decade. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, I was just curious, since Dodie raised the issue, you know, what, what, are, what are your thoughts about that? About that? No, I think it, it is my pattern. These guys are not, you know, they, you know, they don't create the other same Republic of Fever. Sure. You know, or talk to, talk to each other in a letter about a Republic of Fever. But what is definitely going on is they're using the same language that you would see in men who actually are, you know, participating in the self-proclaimed community of Republic of Letters or Republic of Medicine. A number of my actors use that term when they're writing to colleagues back in Great Britain. You know, even to men um, in the West Indies, when they're talking about a variety of projects that might relate to setting up dispensaries, smallpox, um, a lot of these sort of broader interests in medicine, but there's something, there's something different about how they talk about yellow fever and diseases they identify as part of warm climates or ecologies they consider part of warm climates. And that's that moment in which, for example, you know, the writer your colleague back in Great Britain who wants information, who wants to contribute what he knows about typhus and these other diseases, and that's a moment where they're saying, look, we can participate in, you know, this general correspondence and these other topics, but you can't, you can't participate in this. You can't be a part of these networks. And that actually comes out in the letters. And so even though they're actually not using that term, I think they're still deploying that particular concept. Um, but there's something different about their concept of the geography, a sort of like sub-community almost, in which they're actually saying, instead of that, you know, they're turning to a colleague in the Caribbean saying, hey, do you know anybody in Granada that we can talk to? You know, hey, we don't really have any correspondence um, with people in Spain. Um, this is a situation I talked about with Felix Pascali in New York, who, through his connections with somebody in the French military, um, is actually, actually goes to Spain, and he's been sent there in part by some New York physicians to actually find correspondence that can share information about what's going on in Cadiz and the ecologies in that region. Um, and there's a sense in which they're actually trying to create these networks. They're not always that successful because, you know, they don't really know Spanish. And there's still this tendency to read the treatises that they have and say, I, I don't agree with this methodology, I don't know what they're talking about, there's some cultural prejudices there, some really nasty anti-Catholic rhetoric, but there's still that impulse to actually create those particular so, networks so, in so that context. You, so, uh, even though, the, I mean, there's a certain mutual intelligibility going on among these many different parties, uh, you couldn't speak fully of a sort of a concrete discourse that they all, in which they all participate, in which they all, through which they all think, as it were, through which they all imagine the world that they're all dealing with. I mean, uh, you, you speak of times when there are mutual unintelligibilities, and, yes. and when, uh, uh, or for example, certain prejudices like anti-Catholicism would be 
I imagine, more strongly felt in you know the Anglo-Saxon parts of the world than than, than elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, so so talking of it in terms in like discursive terms, that might be challenging. But but I'm guessing that this is a time when you know I mean it's the time of the, sort of the birth of the clinic as well as the birth of the, the modern state as well as the I mean we don't have any truly like concrete you know uh, macro level entities yeah. there at all. I mean these people are. Uh, I don't know. It's, everything's so fluid at this time. That's why I mean I'm so just so in awe of you even trying to do a thing like this because it's so fluid and you don't seem to have the concrete footholds in category terms yeah. which we would have today. Mm -hmm. If we were doing even 19th century history, we would have far stronger sense of it. But I mean, the, everything is so kind of in motion all the time. No, yeah. It's all you know uh, dependent variables. There's no independent variable at all. It seems to me. Yeah, and I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering if there could be some analytic coherence in focusing on governing fever, mm -hmm. because what's interesting is the impulse coming from a 20th century perspective. You know, when you think of medicine, you think of cure or care, and I think what you're talking about with the Republic of Fever is the impulse to govern. How do you govern the fever or the new ill? And I'm wondering if that could lend, if there's a way to use that. You mean government in the, the broader kind of... I mean governing, sense. like how do you move and count and it's this, the impulse to govern is actually what's, what's, what's creating a, at some level a kind of coherency in rhetoric. Yeah, and I think governing, you know, we can talk about governing at the level of actually dealing with the healthy and the, the sick, but there's also an issue, the issue of like governing knowledge, governing a sense of place. You know, what I see a lot of these women doing, um, just because of what's happening, um, this climate side, you know, their patterns of movement, you know, is trying to, to map out those environments and literally map them out to kind of create, you know, collect as much information as possible about these environments that are changing so dramatically. Um, <coughs> that's my train of thought. That's very annoying. Um, government. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's like govern the government through governing through counting. Extreme disease, governing through survey, governing through counting, governing through. Yes, yes, exactly. And those are unif I mean, I actually think you could, I don't know what you guys think, but I think you could probably build on that and create a more coherent analytic framework for the Republic of Fever that way. Maybe there's rules of governing this, this Republic of Fever that are um, different from the various, you know, governments that these councils are coming from. It, yes. Um, maybe there's some, they create some type of different form of government that's more Atlantic and not mm -hmm. American or, or British. Or... John, do you want to come up? Um, the problem here is you're dealing with two things. One is disease. Mm -hmm. The other, yeah, disease and climate. The other is public health. Public health is a, I think, a pretty much later idea. Uh, you want to have a community to have public health. Uh, the state, indeed, sometimes, particularly as I understand it in continental Europe, stepped in to say, this is the community, and then took the constant, said that there was a community, or acted as if there were a community. But if you're going to have public health, you're going to have policy, Etc. Etc. All that government stuff. Uh, you know, um, that's one thing. Uh, what you're dealing with here, also, I mean, is that element that you're dealing with knowledge and a community which has a very different basis. And I keep wondering about the obvious things. For example, the mail. Uh, I know Louis XIV had a marvelous mail system, so that people absolutely assumed by that period that the mail would go through. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is, I mean, it's just breathtaking <laughs> that they made this assumption and it worked. Mm -hmm. I just, it seems very anachronist to me. And you're dealing with people long after Louis XIV, mm -hmm. and they absolutely assumed so we have already then the correspondence, the letter writing, and as it develops, mm -hmm. and people make certain assumptions. According to the standard history of the journal, 
uh, the next step is the round robin letters, and the step after that then is the regularly published serial journal. And you are dealing with people who are working with all of these stages at once. Am I wrong? <laughs> no, I, I actually think that um, that you're right. I think um, one way of actually seeing this, and you might disagree with me, um, what I do see happening is a lot of these metas are actually building these networks. You know, it, it, a lot of them are new networks. A lot of it is actually growing out of correspondence, new forms of correspondence that they're trying to set up, or you know, using correspondence for different means. And you also see them. You know, by taking these treatises and manipulating them and adapting them, so you get these multiple editions that are just kind of get fatter and fatter because they have to accommodate and integrate all this new information and reference one another and try and talk to one another as treatises. Finally, you get to a point where they're actually just creating their own periodicals, or periodicals that are supposed to serve as a forum for these communities, but also promote certain ideas for community. So with the medical repository, not only sending out letters to get correspondence and trying to, you know, pick from journals um, that are going to uh, help them kind of assemble this new information about warm climate diseases through the medium of reviews and editorial commentary, they're actually trying to instill certain reading practices in these communities. So they're not just actually circulating the journals, they're inclu encouraging participants, um, they're encouraging people to adopt this worldview, basically. Um, and so I think in that sense, you actually see them kind of going through these different stages as you talk about. Is that, okay. It's actually, it's interesting, um, it brings me back to a point that you were making about um, governance and forms of governance that are adapted to this new community, because what's interesting about, um, is, what's interesting about this print is a lot of what I see happening in Medical Positor, it's a really fun journal, you guys. I feel really dirty when I say this and I talk about it at parties and people kind of stare at me and go off to other people to talk to. But <laughs> I mean, the Medical Positor, they're not just pulling from the genre of, um, of medical literature during this time. It's actually also from the Republican culture of political print. Um, there's a lot of overlap between um, the Medical Repository and um, political prints in the United States, you know, you see actually these medical um, commentators, you know, in the medical repository, but also, you know, reprinting in the early republic. And for those of you who've actually done, worked on the early American republic, probably those in some scholarship that's come out that's talked about the role of these um, periodicals in trying to promote certain visions of what the nation is supposed to be, of what the republic is supposed to be. And so you have these competing um, networks that crop up, and the medical repository also crops up in that context, and they adopt sort of the same sort of political strategies. They're actually trying to promote the sense of community as a way of um, sort of, um, in a way, kind of snuffing out these other ideas of what the medical world order is supposed to be, or these other sorts of things that they cast as rumors about disease that are circulating in New York and other parts of the, the Atlantic world. So that might actually speak to your point about not just adapting these technologies for medical communities, but adapting those types of technologies um, to a different type of geography, almost. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think yeah. it does. I guess I was wondering, I mean, I thought that maybe the, you know, the subtitle of this the dissertation could be Six Degrees of Benjamin Rush. Um, but, <laughs> but because, you know, if we think about these networks and the kind of connections that it makes, but, you know, in, in, in him we also see someone who, you know, you sort of set up these categories as the medical and the political, but I, I, I guess I'm, I'm still not convinced how separate those categories are. I mean, I think as analytical categories, we're seeing them separately, but I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not sure that, well, I, or I'd like to be convinced about the degree to which people on the ground see these as, as really distinct forms of knowledge or that the, the practices are, you know, are not um, complementary. Uh, and, and, you know, and Rush is a good, you know, is a good example of, of someone like that who was able to, um, you know, cup in the morning and si you know sign things in the afternoon. Um, it's an important document, you know, in terms of taking part in momentous political happenings. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how can we how can we think about these, you know, these the, the distinctions within the realms, or or is the establishment of the public with fever in part creating a distinct realm of 
of um, or going further into sort of creating a distinct realm of the medical. Mm -hmm. um, so the underlying question is political versus medicine. It could be continuity, it doesn't have to be, you know, I, right. I'm, I, Could it be creating the medical as political power? Or could you push your statement, more, you know, we're talking about what's new and Catherine's work, I really see that, that could be a, a, one of the contributions. This could be the period where you're creating the medical as political, mm -hmm. international political power. Well, I think, I think I... Disagree. <laughs> I mean, we, we like... I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're, what you're doing is crossing where you have a profession before you have expertise. And the idea of expertise, which we do lots of construction with later, I think may still be fairly valid here. But these people had expertise which would be general knowledge, broad knowledge. And you're, you're seeing broad knowledge. You're seeing people saying, well, I'm expert in tropical disease. Mm -hmm. And there are people who deal with this professionally. And there are the people who as government, government authorities and business people mm -hmm. have to deal with disease, with nature, with disease. Mm -hmm. Is this not biopolitics as Foucault uh, has? Well, you're imposing analytic categories <laughs> of sort of grand order here. Um, but, but there's a hybridity about that, that very category, which, right. which maybe has a certain flexibility to it, which might be helpful to you here. I don't know if you've used the term at all. Biopolitical? Biopolitical, yeah. I, I haven't used it, no. But it, 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 I, I mean, given that, at least within the, insofar as there is a nation state, uh, context going on at this time as, as far as those are concretizing at this moment uh, uh, that clearly at least I think would, would prove to most people's satisfaction this is a very primary concern and it, and it covers almost everything but it makes you know the, uh, uh, so nothing's outside it uh, you know it exceeds everything so uh, I might be I don't know like, it might I, be helpful um, sorry I, I don't think you have bio political I mean the biological doesn't even exist until like 1800 if you want to be really strict so you're going to be strict it, yeah. really so um, I was sort of wondering as we're kind of talking kind of reflexively about the categories that you're using um, here whether whether actually the medical and, and, and the public health are actually kind of secondary uh, and the political is kind of secondary too it seems as though the two things that are very tangible here are the, the emergence and um, um, sort of durable existence of an epistemic community, which is fairly loosely coupled, mm -hmm. um, which isn't, you know, discursively tightly knit, um, and an ecology, uh, you know, a, a, um, a transnational, a, a transatlantic ecology that includes, as you say, sort of pathogens, people, goods, and, and fairly regular sort of trading networks and those those things are, i think exist mm -hmm. and that's that, that and, and so you call that the republic of letters which is you know far better than calling it you know pre-modern transnational epistemological medical communities you know that 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 is <laughs> <where it's, laughs> some well, that's a great right, right. Um, <laughs> and so within that i mean clearly there is government going on here these people clearly want trade to continue they want and um, you know, public order to be maintained. Um, but I wonder if that's kind of secondary to the, these two sort of other issues which we can sort of say demonstrably exist. And you know, another second thing I would, I would look at is also, as someone coming at this from the 19th century, um, you mentioned cholera, you mentioned the way that sort of modern public health people tend to view this period as kind of, um, as, as unproductive. I mean, you have to ask what cholera does to this uh, model, and cholera is obviously a, a disease which, which does spread to Europe and, and, and hit European populations, and then does, uh, along with other endemic diseases, in an industrial age, generate um, a, pub, a true public health, a true sense that there is a state that's going to try and look after more or less the health of everyone uh, to a greater or lesser extent. And there are national differences in that. So this is, in, in many ways, we get a more national model after we have a more transnational model. And we also get this um, this real rise of anti-contagionism, which really thrives for, you know, for the 
the first part of the 19th century, this, this belief that diseases like cholera, not all diseases, but are uh, not contagious and are produced by environmental circumstances, which is a holdover from this kind of climate thing, but also is a denial of the global, the denial of things that are actually, this is caused by trade networks, second, uh, oh, this is caused by us being dirty. Um, so at the same time as you know, you've got some form of globalization leading to new epidemics, it's kind of also denied in the, in the, in the theory of disease. So I wonder if you could also speak a little bit about the, the working theories of disease that are going on here. I mean, it, are we still are we talking about something kind of loosely uh, sort of local, spontaneous, um, climatic? Uh, it, does anybody uh, think this disease is contagious? Um, how is it conceived and, and how does it relate to to cholera later. Um, there is an interesting uh, trend that I pick up on. I feel like a lot of the actors, when they're first kind of coming into terms with yellow fever, um, they're they're actually using the framework of, of plague right. and these sort of old right. ideas about uh, plague as a contagious mm. disease. They're seeing it crop up in seaports. Right. But if you look at the early treatises, it's the language that they use. Right. And they're making references to the Marseille outbreak in right, the okay. 1920s, for example. Um, and so there's this sort of model of, um, uh, of contagion of it being mm -hmm. imported and also just kind of um, being spread as well. But also being able to, to thrive best in these warmer climates mm -hmm. versus these northern climates. What happens over time, and there's actually an interesting question about how this leads to sort of like the, the prominence of anti-contagionist views in this later period. Um, is that a lot of these treatises tend to just sort of shift to this idea like, no, it's actually really just particular to the warm climates, okay. you know, and then they're, they're accumulating all this information about these regions and coming to the conclusion that this is just not in Northern Europe mm -hmm. at all. This is, the, this is something very particular to right. these other spaces um, within the Atlantic world. And so you see this shift in, in views and the idea that it is actually local. Not everyone agrees mm -hmm. with this. I mean, some, of, some tensions do right. actually persist. But there's a way in which, um, you know, those views just tend to become most prominent. And what's interesting is um, they, you know, they, they carry them back to Europe as well to talk about plague and to talk about quarantine more mm -hmm. generally. In a way, you could actually argue that, I mean, a lot of the actors I talk about who are returning to Paris, they actually bring these debates not only to yellow fever, um, but when they're participating in the cholera debates, I think they're actually carrying that framework with them. I mean, this is just some of the initial research they were doing for chapter six, but I definitely see that happening. So it's kind of, they're working through these different disease experiences, right. if you will, know, including up to cholera. So, right. um, there were a lot more in the comments that you actually made, though. I forgot what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have more questions? I mean, I, I, I could ask more. Uh, yeah, and this, this may be um, really anachronistic. Um, I, I, I do that a lot. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm wondering, in terms of like, like um, Chris, Chris was talking about how um, you know these understandings of disease. Um, was their understanding of yellow um, yellow fever essentially environmental? That, that warm places cause um, cause this and and. But my, my real question involves uh, possible treatment or, or prevention, right? Like, were there, were there any ideas like, about um, what, what, what to do about this problem, right? Like, you mentioned the, the more uh, well-to-do, you know, could, could leave these environments uh, where, where, where there were outbreaks. But were there any efforts to transform the environments and make them less yellow feverish? Yellow feverish? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah, no, um, it is. There is a sense of like the environment actually generating yellow fever, or I mean, in some cases, for those who are still advocating this idea that it's important, it's the idea that it's generated on ships right. um, and then you know carried into these spaces. There's a sense still like these particular spaces that actually cause yellow fever, and so you actually see these efforts. You know, Philadelphia is a great example where they're actually um, build these new waterworks to actually sort of. Um, kind of flush fresh water into the city and kind of in that sense promote a cleanlier environment. Um, you see some efforts in other cities to promote cleanliness um, and to increase these new practices and just cleaning the streets. I don't really know if they were that entirely successful um, with this. Um, but you also see some of them actually clinging on to quarantine 
because, you know, they don't want to just, it's really difficult to just get rid of quarantine idea, you know, um, and just to completely um, absolve it. Um, and, you know, they're still using it for other diseases. And in some cases, you know, geopolitics intervenes. And guess what? If your trading partner in Europe really wants you to keep up quarantine, you're going to do it because, you know, you really want to keep up trade with that port. So, um, so that speaks to um, the question. Is there another question in there, actually? No. No, not really. About <laughs> these prevention? Okay. Well, it seems like what you're doing with 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 all of this is you're you're really looking at how a kind of an epistemological, you might even say governmental, or whatever, this, uh, ecological set structures are put in place, which in turn impact upon the way cholera is certainly um, perceived. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that in itself. You, there, there is this tendency to see cholera as, as okay. There's like there's sort of almost like a blank slate, a sort of of, of, of um, uh, sort of disease blank slate, and then suddenly cholera comes in and changes everything. Well, well you've actually got this a much more kind of dynamic sort of connections between the two. Mm -hmm. um, I had something else that I was going to say about about that, but I've, I've forgotten now. Um, no, the, well. Well, you're thinking about it, I'll just say, <laughs> or respond. I mean, there are scholars in Peter Baldwin, for example, right. and he actually talks about the um, history of the relationship between um, the states and contagion. Mm -hmm. And he kind of carries it through these different stages. And he's focused on Europe. Um, but he goes directly from early modern plague to cholera. Right. So there's this huge gap in right. between. And of course, you know, places like Great Britain, yellow fever never actually came to these places, right. but, you know, southern France. Um, the Mediterranean, and also just the fact that these were empires, right. you actually had to deal with them from abroad. You know, there's this really important question, especially with these men who are coming back mm -hmm. to Great Britain, these places, and want to take, you know, action in right. developing public health policy and participating in that. That's what they're carrying with mm -hmm. them when they're dealing with the problem of cholera right. or the spread of plague. No, I mean, there is this very standard idea that there are no new diseases in Europe between, you know, the, sort of the 16th century and, and the 19th century. Um, which is, you know, an, 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 which is still persisting in the literature, and I think that uh, you're sort of blowing that apart is really important in what you're doing. We have time for a, one or two more questions if people have them. Yes. What's, what's the overall purpose of the Republic of Fever? And um, that may sound silly, but I don't think it, we should take it for granted that that they're necessarily philanthropic. Do they want everyone to be free of fever? Or are different members of this republic <coughs> trying to get at this network of knowledge for different reasons? That's a really, really great question. I mean, we could always just sort of frame it as everyone, everyone in the republic, not everyone, but a lot of them will say, this is all for useful knowledge. But I think this goes back to the point I was raising earlier about the public of letters more generally, is that even though people are talking about this ideal, it's really this negotiated process. So I don't, I think, even though we see these networks um, emerging, one of the things I'm going to have to trace out in this, and I don't have a direct answer for you, is seeing it as something that's just constantly negotiated. That people are participating in it, um, and they're exchanging knowledge, but you know there are these ulterior motives, or there's, uh, there are these certain practices that rest on things that aren't necessarily about useful knowledge. I mean, you know, Henry Hill, for example, you know, he's, he's presenting this as useful knowledge, but he's thinking about commerce. You know, he's thinking well, that's about, why it's useful, though. I mean, yes. you know, we have to un the, the definition of useful exactly. at this time. Uh, so. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just excited. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah. So I think that, that to some extent it is contested, but somehow, I mean, this, these networks do nonetheless actually emerge. I don't think all of them are completely successful. In some cases, things just sort of get lost in translation, as you will. Um, but uh, yes, so. It's kind of like, you know, with the early American Republic or some of the other republics that we study, you know, sort of the nation state. There's, you know, I don't, if we look at some of the literature on, you know, political culture and formation during that period, you know, people are at each other's throats about what the nation is supposed to be, but there still is this sense of, um, of the sort of independent entity that needs to become something, I guess. So, so. You said that these articles, uh, these medical uh, articles in these journals were then gleaned and then dropped in newspapers and journals of other sorts? Yes. And, and I wonder what, uh, like, what other articles are like, kind of surrounding these as the public or is reading these pages or, or even talking about it in, mm -hmm. in, the, you know, in the public sphere or whatever. I wonder what, what they're reading around it that, that would like, 
maybe show like what kind of topics this is informing. Um, and then just just a thought. Um, outside of the medical outside of the yellow fever, like the, they'll read an article about yellow fever, and then you know, and the column next to it, there'll be something about governance or you know, uh, city cl uh, cleanliness or something. In the like newspapers that. or in the in the newspapers. Topic? No, in the newspapers, um, they are actually very often just sort of embedded in these other you know news about um, you know commerce. Um, commercial news, things that are relevant to Philadelphia, but you also have political essays. You know, it does make a difference, for example, if, you know, it's, it's, it's actually pretty interesting, this gets back to the overlap between, um, you know, uh, politics and medicine, if we want to use those categories, you know, it's, it's a couple of the actors, um, in order to promote their own views um, among local, you know, health organizations, or even the public, um, more largely, they actually tap into some of their connections, like some people who write, you know, the Federalist newspaper networks, or have some connections to political print networks that run between these cities, um, to actually circulate some of their periodicals, or their response to certain medical periodicals, um, to appeal to those audiences, and you'll actually see them adopt a different political rhetoric than what they would actually use in some of the medical periodicals and correspondence, so. Well, I think we've just about run out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank Catherine and, and everyone for coming uh, for what's been a really, really interesting session. And I hope you